Welcome to another edition, a special edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 866. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Jeff Walton. It's June 28th, 2024. All right, we actually have an embedded person at the trope. Uh, he's not really there officially on Anglican TV business, but uh, he was there and graciously and kind enough to uh, offer some time here at the end of the uh, uh, assembly to talk about what went on this week. Uh, clearly, we have a new guy. Uh, uh, it's Archbishop Steve Wood. He's from the uh, Diocese of the Carolinas. Um, was he as surprised as we are? Yes, and he said as much. Um, we've had several opportunities as uh, participants at Assembly uh, to hear from Wood, uh, including um, in a press conference yesterday afternoon, which I attended, mm -hmm. and then also today speaking to the uh, plenary session with his wife, Jackie. And uh, he said he was uh, surprised. Um, this is not what he expected going into the conclave. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a lot of other people are surprised as well. Um, Kevin, uh, if you had seen online chatter beforehand, there were some names that were circulated, um, not by me, but were circulated, and uh, Steve Wood was not among those names. Mm -hmm. So this was a significant surprise to many people. However, for those who were here in Latrobe 10 years ago, when um, Bob Duncan was concluding his term as Archbishop, um, you will, of course, recall that... Um, uh, Archbishop Foley Beach was not among uh, the the names that had been touted ahead of that conclave, uh, and he emerged as Archbishop, uh, which was, of course, a great surprise um, to everyone. So this is not without precedent. Mm -hmm. um, this is a very the conclave includes the entirety of the College of Bishops. However, only those bishops who are seated diocesans are uh, with a vote. So you're looking at um, only about 29 people, um, and that means these are all in relationship with one another. And uh, this is not a traditional campaign that is uh, in a public sense. So um, everyone seems to have been surprised by the announcement uh, this past Saturday. And uh, Bishop, uh, now Archbishop Wood, um, appears to be among those who was surprised. Now, the question has always been, will the next archbishop cause the, the final division of the ACNA? Uh, you know, Duncan held us together. He got us together. But Duncan was Duncan. Uh, Foley, he probably can't do it. Well, he pulled it off. Um, is there any sense there that uh, Bishop or Archbishop Steve Wood uh, doesn't have the ability to, to hold this all together? I believe that he does. However, there are uh, there was some chatter online, um, a group that perhaps maybe I've uncharitably designated as the online catastrophists. And not everyone I disagree with is an online catastrophist, let me right. make that clear. Mm -hmm. um, but the there were a lot of people who had predictions of dire uh, things if the wrong person happened to be elected, whoever they perceived that wrong person to be. Um, Probably the most noteworthy thing is even though I am told that there were several rounds of voting and there were at least three finalists uh, within the uh, selection process in the conclave, um, ultimately the final vote was a vote that was unanimous. And this signals that uh, Steve Wood was an acceptable um, archbishop to each of the other members of the college who were seated diocesans. Mm -hmm. I think that's very significant. Um, I can also tell you that uh, chatting with uh, many people afterwards, there were just a lot of smiles. Um, people had been familiar with the process in 2014 and were prepared for it to be an arduous one. And they were able to do this in, in two days. And um, it, it was something that was satisfactory to all. So in answer to your question, you know, is this going to have the ACNA spiral apart? Um, I don't believe so. And while there are important differences with the ACNA, which I'm not going to minimize, uh, I do want to say that those are not first order issues at the moment that will cause division as related to the office of Archbishop. And I think we find that with the seated bishops. Those bishops uh, who are seated and in charge of the diocese voted for 
uh, Steve Wood to be the next Archbishop, the leader. And nobody came out of there with a minority report. Nobody came out of there with dissent. Um, and so for those people, the, the chattering class on uh, Facebook and Instagram and uh, X, I would recommend if you have questions, talk to your bishop. Uh, your bishop endorsed yes. and voted for this person. And uh, your bishop, for that moment, did not find uh, these issues to be first church uh, uh, issues. And uh, um, that gives a, you know a little bit of honeymoon to Steve Wood because we, we will, you know, f at least for, for the next decade, have this discussion with the elephant in the room and non-geographical diocese. Now you attended uh, the press conference and uh, we mm -hmm. gave you some questions. Uh, question mm -hmm. one was, uh, uh, what's the timeline on non-geographical diocese? W w what'd they say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, right out of the gate, Steve Wood gave me a very direct answer, which was that geographic dioceses are the norm within Anglicanism. And as you know, Diocese of Carolinas is a geographic diocese. Mm -hmm. um, uh, however, he said, this is something that's going to be on the conversational level within the college, and he does not foresee a resolution in the near future to this um, uh, this this difference. Mm -hmm. um, that do, said, does he think it's um, a problem? He, does he think that that non geographical is a problem? I don't want to put words in his mouth, but when he said it's outside the norm, mm -hmm. I think that indicates where where he feels on it that this is not the ideal and it's not consistent with what the church has historically understood. Mm -hmm. So that is the the hope that um, there will be a um, a, a movement towards um, well, uh, one of the things he noted in the press conference was he served on what's called the Anglican Unity Task Force. Mm -hmm. And this is a task force that, uh, navigates many of these issues, uh, including in overlapping jurisdictions, things like how do you transfer congregations between different dioceses, which can and does happen in ACNA, and um, how do you preserve good relationships while you're doing that. So this is something that I, I think is uh, that, that there's he signaled that there is an interest in moving in a direction that would. Um, uh, move towards geographic dioceses uh, since that is consistent with the norm. However, um, sometimes people uh, perceive that the Archbishop has powers that he does not have. Correct. Yeah. A lot of this is on the constitutional and canonical level. So while there can be gentlemen's agreements between diocesan bishops, um, ultimately the idea of a, a, a change of this level, which would require an act of assembly to ratify, it does not happen quickly, and uh, this would be sometime in the future. But, you know, Kevin, I think there has been progress that has been made on this front at this assembly. There were two jurisdictions that now no longer exist. The Via Apostolica Special mm. Missionary District has yeah. been dissolved. That was dissolved at Council on Tuesday, and its congregations have mostly transferred to the Anglican Network in Canada, which is Canada's geographic diocese. Um, additionally, Another diocese, um, the International Diocese, which is made up of the former uh, convocation of churches that were under the ecclesiastical oversight of Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, that was, uh, uh, it was Arch uh, uh, Bishop Bill Atwood. That's right. correct. Mm -hmm. And um, Bishop Bill Atwood uh, is retiring at this assembly. And um, as a result of that, uh, that diocese is dissolving and is releasing its congregations. Some of them will be going to the Diocese of the Southwest. Others will be going to a new special missionary district that will be formed within the Diocese of Churches for the, um, excuse me, Diocese of Christ Our Hope. Mm -hmm. And um, that, uh, so what's happening is you're, you're sort of getting um, a, a step towards having a smaller number of overlapping dioceses. And I suspect that there's a number of ways this could happen gradually, is if there are, as bishops retire, um, if uh congregations are uh, released at that point, uh, that could be one thing that would happen. Uh, another thing that can happen as well is um, you could really see that in certain places such as South Carolina, 
there is a contact bishop for all the overlapping jurisdictions to make sure that they communicate with one another and understand that they're not like planting churches right on top of each other, which has happened in ACNA. Sure, in well, 2009 happened in Las Vegas. Yeah, yeah. In, in 2009, um, uh, my congregation, the Falls Church Anglican in uh, suburban Northern Virginia, planted a congregation that uh, is part of what became the Diocese of the Mid Atlantic. Uh, back then it was Cana. And then what happened was um, the Anglican Mission in America planted one as well, literally um, about half a mile away. Uh, and both were sort of low church reformed congregations. And they didn't realize until just a few months before launch that both of these were coming out, one from Church of the Resurrection on Capitol Hill and one from the Falls Church Anglican. So by having a contact bishop for a geographic area, that means that these will all um, go through sort of the same channels so people can understand what's going on and they're not duplicating efforts or creating difficulties for one another. And uh, that is something we've seen. Uh, it's also taking place in New England uh, and a few other areas where there is a, a key contact bishop for all of the overlapping jurisdictions. Okay, so we also have churches now and then that come out of the fray and say, we are affirming. Uh, mm -hmm. of, the, of the topic of the day, which is obviously mm -hmm. gender and sexuality. Um, was anybody asking questions about that? Yes. Um, so um, Matt Kennedy of the Stand Firm uh, blog uh, asked a really pressing question in regards to a congregation in uh, Franklin, Tennessee, uh, some of your uh, listeners already are familiar with, called Luminous Anglican Church. Sure. And uh, just to give a very quick update, what happened was um, there was a, uh, a musician from Jars of Clay who uh, shared a photo with a um, gentleman who was a clergyman um, at a pride festival in the Nashville area. And uh, the, uh, the person he was with was a associate clergy person at an ACNA church. Um, this uh, fellow was not an ACNA clergyman himself, but uh, he he was serving as an associate in the capacity in ACNA church. And uh, he had a t-shirt on with, you know, the rainbow colors that signified this um, support. Mm -hmm. And this was something that was a uh, really very disturbing uh, to many of us. And um, to, to their, the credit of uh, the diocese that this is a part of, which is diocese of churches for the sake of others. Um, they uh, immediately made some phone calls and uh, as George has shared, it appears that Luminous Church has already had a congregational vote this past Sunday uh, to uh, sever its connection with C4SO and by extension ACNA. Mm -hmm. um, but that's still, there's still questions of how did it get to this point where a congregation within ACNA could be at such a distance from uh, something that issues of human anthropology and then specifically in gender and sexuality um, like how is it that they were on such a different page in this? So um, Matt uh, Kennedy asked um, the Archbishop elect about this, and he said, "Well, the first thing that would need to happen is if this is was in my diocese, uh, I would pick up the phone right away and uh, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with those involved." And he said, "When I am Archbishop, um, that role will shift, and if it's not one of my uh, parishes in the Carolinas." then it will be a direct conversation with the diocesan who's in charge because he's respecting the chain of authority. And then that diocesan will then proceed with it after being uh, notified and uh, having a discussion with the archbishop. Um, so this is how the chains of authority need to work. Um, but I think there is a greater question, which is um, it, it's really important for churches to be in connection with one another in a diocese. And when you have a diocese that's geographically disparate, where there aren't regular contacts, um, it can be very um, hard to form ongoing relationships and people can perhaps run off the rails before that's realized and it's too late. This is now, the f appears to be, if, if what's been fourth reported is true, yeah. this would be the fourth congregation um, to depart. Uh, I have said before, that I do not believe this is specifically a C4SO problem referring to the diocese, but that this is a broader 
post-evangelical problem. Mm -hmm. And it seems to just manifest itself within C4SO because C4SO has been uh, so centered upon church planting among populations of those coming out of an evangelical or sometimes charismatic context. So this is something that um, I think Matt was really uh, on the ball to to ask about. And um, I said um, uh, over a year ago when um, the Table Church Indianapolis departed ACNA that they were not the first and they would not be the last. And um, that's the same case with, assume, assumedly, if what we understand is correct, at Luminous Church. They were not the first and they will not be the last. So we have to ask about what is in place relationally to properly catechize our people and to understand what is being taught by our clergy. Uh, any other questions that were uh, interesting to you that appeared at the press conference? Yeah, um, there were, um, uh, there was a third one, um, which I'll, I'll have to pull out my notes to, to remember, right. sure. but um, it's a, um, I'm sorry, it's on my laptop, um, uh, but the, there was, um, I, I tweeted about each of these, um, so uh, non-geographic dioceses, um, theological drift in congregations such as Luminous Church, and then um, the, um, oh, I'm sorry, I can't remember the third, but I'll make sure to, <laughs> to tweet, tweet about it. On yeah, Twitter. no problem. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, um, you know, the week in general. Obviously, people are very happy to have a, a new archbishop, and we're saying goodbye to Archbishop Foley. How did that go? You know, it it was a very sweet time, and I'm trying not to be uh, too ebullient about this because I just came out of the the closing choral Eucharist, which was sure. just majest majestic. Mm -hmm. And um, but one of the things I get to do at assembly is connect with people in congregations that are in very different places and different kinds than my own. And an example of this would be I've had congregation, uh, excuse me, conversations this week from rectors in places like Anchorage, Alaska, uh, Honolulu. I spoke with a lay leader from a congregation in Vermont, the only ACNA congregation in that state. And um, you know, praying with people in other um, dioceses like within the Reformed Episcopal Church and just really sweet uh, relational time. This shows that we're moving into a new stage, Kevin. We were sort of started not really as a denomination, but functionally a confederation of exactly. probably multiple jurisdictions that were brought under the same umbrella. But really, it took a while for us to grow into a church. And I think there's been significant progress on that front. Now, some people are going to hear that and say, well, Jeff, you're being overly optimistic because there's some serious disagreements. And those people are correct. But I'm seeing people come together to love one another, to speak difficult disagreements with one another, and to authentically seek to understand what the other person believes in a way that is not dismissive and that values other people's voices in a way that uh, they cannot be caricatured. Um, so I, I see that, and I see that in both the liturgical things that are taking place in the relational uh, conversations on the side and in the mission networks people are engaged in, including a variety of different ministries in and orbiting around ACNA. And that's an uh, important we, point because uh, one of the things that's happened internationally in the church is uh, we have distorted what it means to listen. You know, mm -hmm. we will have a listening process. But within the ACNA, they have a real listening process. Bishops are there to yeah. listen to one another. A clergy will listen to one another. Uh, they, you know, they will have the disagreement, but they're not going to have it in daba about it. Um, the, yeah. You know, the, the, they still love each other and honor the process uh, as much as anything. Yes, and uh, this is this is very important because so many people who came out of the Episcopal Church context mm -hmm. felt that they were not heard. And one thing that's listening is not the same as coming to agreement or disagreement. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, we have to be able to, to know why someone is arguing. And the, I, I think we have made progress in this way. And there's also unique things that are happening in ACNA that I don't think are widely happening elsewhere in American Christianity. Um, we have a big umbrella 
and that's bringing together some very different people. I mean, at the opening Eucharist, I had communion elements that were served to me from Bishop Todd Hunter and Bishop Bill Love. And I was like, you know, they, they both serve very different jurisdictions within ACNA. Mm-hmm. But that was like a cosmic event for me that only ACNA could facilitate. Um, and it doesn't mean that there are not real serious disagreements. Um, I'm not trying to minimize here. What I'm saying is there's a understanding of what the main thing is. And part of that main thing is to love and serve your neighbor and to understand why they are seriously convicted in, 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 in their conscience about key issues. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is not, do not mistake this as smile time, happy hour. Oh, everyone's just one big happy family. What it is, is a family that's truly um, committed to one another and wanting to see the others um, thrive. And then they will, like real families, they will they will argue about things that matter. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that's what's, what, what's happening here. But as I said before, the selection of Steve Wood as the new archbishop is something that every diocesan bishop within the college uh, could support. And um, I think that, that that means something. We are not on the verge of a cataclysm, and we also have to trust in God's sovereignty and providence. He is doing something through us that is not of our own doing. Um, he, well, hold on. That's another, I mean, impor- I, that's another very important part here. Uh, scripture tells us we'll be known by our fruits, you know. Yes. And, and here, the church that has serious disagreements, that has the elephant in the room, that has non-geographical, non-geographical diocese, that has some um, <clears throat> questionable bishopmanship, um, still has a growing, thriving uh, dynamic within North America and the world. You know, I can't think of any other denomination that can raise their hands and say, "Oh, we grew this year." Who? I mean, oh. it's yeah. it, it is pretty significant, and um, the on Tuesday at council, which is the annual meeting um, that sort of uh, precedes assembly, uh, we were given the uh, ACNA's uh, parochial report statistics, which are called congregational statistics in mm-hmm. ACNA uh, for the year twenty twenty three. Um, uh, as your readers may already know, they were positive. Um, we've had a complete rebound from COVID. Um, there was a uh, about a two and a half percent growth in membership. There was a growth of thirty six total net congregations, but perhaps most importantly, there was a twelve percent increase in a single year in attendance. Wow, that's extraordinary. I'm not aware of any other denomination in the United States of our size that is experiencing that kind of growth. Now, some people will say, "Wait a minute, Jeff. If you go back to pre-COVID." And factor in those numbers, we've only really grown 0.6% in, uh, since 2019. And that's true. But across five years, we're in a net positive, And the last year was extremely uh, good. The other thing I would say that really matters is that's a broad-based growth that was experienced. There were 29 jurisdictions in ACNA in the year 2023. And of those, um, all but five saw growth. Um, and some of them, like... Diocese of the Carolinas, where um, Steve Wood has been diocesan bishop and and continues to be, uh, they had just an extraordinary growth. Um, You know, one thing we learned today at the uh, plenary session was that when Diocese of Carolinas was formed, and it took it was about a two year process, there were only four congregations that had a previous identity within the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. The other thirty six congregations, since then, were all planted. Well, that, that's pretty amazing. There are not only, Bishop Wood is not only a supporter of church planting, but he has networks and systems in place which facilitate the planting of churches and the support of those churches into mature parishes. Um, this is something that is really positive, and we would like to see it continued um, uh, elsewhere. Um, so the, just the fact that 20, um, uh, 24, 25 of these uh, 29 jurisdictions saw 
a improvement in average Sunday attendance in the year 2023 shows that this is not just a one-off thing. Um, this is that this is really quite significant, and um, if we can maintain this for an additional year, um, ACNA will be uh, larger than it has ever been. Um, so uh, this is we have congregations in places that are are now further away than we've ever had, and um, we have um, ministries reaching people that otherwise wouldn't have been reached. Uh, this is, I don't see how you can look at this and not be really thankful to God. There's, there's really good things happening. And um, I, I think there's something to be said about God's providence in this. Mm-hmm. Um, he hasn't forgotten about us and he's able to use us as uh, broken vessels. Um, one of the things that has been talked about by Archbishop Wood is this this concept of, uh, you know, as, as your readers know, he was one of the first people to get COVID-19. He was hospitalized. He was on a ventilator for over 10 days when she was sedated, um, had a pretty arduous recovery process. Additionally, um, before then, uh, the church had burned down um, the, the ministry center um, and offices uh, and most of um, the St. Andrews Mount Pleasant had been destroyed in a fire, mm-hmm. a 48,000 square foot structure. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so, so there's been... The, the place where he was consecrated, Bishop, was burned down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, now that's since been rebuilt. But it, it, it shows that God can work through things that are, are really traumatic. And the theme that Archbishop Wood has shared of this, it's become a, a theme at St. Andrew's Mount Pleasant, is beauty from ashes. Mm-hmm. This idea that, that God is taking and redeeming things. And uh, you know, it, it was not probably a comfortable thing to, to say at the time, but it was there was, there was good fruit that came out of uh, uh, the calamity of St. Andrew's Mount Pleasant uh, burning. And, uh, you know, having a, a beautiful rebuilt structure, having improved relations with neighbors that have become more aware of the church and uh, have connected with its life. I, I think that's something that I'm like, wow, I want that. I want my parish to have that kind of connection with its neighbors. I want us to be known and supported and support other churches in our area, even outside of our tradition. Mm-hmm. And um, that's something that's signaled um, there that the that's very positive and that we can aspire to not for our, just ourselves, but we can aspire to something for, uh, for Christ church. Okay. Uh, once his election was announced, uh, my email box filled up with people who referred to a uh, letter he co-authored um, mm-hmm. about George Floyd and uh, mm-hmm. kind of the, the knee jerk reaction uh, the letter uh, uh, salutated. And so uh, was mm-hmm. that brought up at all this week as to uh, um, rela- race race relations and um, um, uh, race formularies? Um, it was not directly brought up, although I wish I had brought it up at the press conference because mm-hmm. that's a good point. The letter is available and I have reread it. Mm-hmm. Um, it it's easy for me to have hindsight that is 2020 Mm -hmm. um today would i have authored that letter or signed it no but that was in 2020 and um we're in a different place now as a as a nation um so um i I can't be critical of that without acknowledging that that i'm looking back at it at a different phase and i'm a different person than i was in that period um so um that that was not extensively brought up and and talked about. However, I did remember the third question that was asked at the press conference, which uh, I had forgotten about earlier. Um, It was about the open letters that have been circulated among clergy within the ACNA. And there have been a few of these, but the two that are specifically noteworthy uh, as far as the widest circulation are uh, one regarding the uh the process of um, sexual abuse uh allegations and investigations mm-hmm. and uh the the length of time it has taken to do a court process sure um uh, i could not speak about this earlier this week because i was serving on the acna trial court for a bishop and uh, it would not have been appropriate for me to weigh in on that um now that assembly is concluded my three-year term is done and i can 
I can report on this. Um, but um, without any sort of confidentiality issues, but just to say that there is there are canonical processes that are in place. And uh, Archbishop Foley Beach said that sometimes some of these clergy who signed these letters are assuming that there are powers that are in place for um, the bishops or the archbishop specifically that um, the HNA constitution and canons don't actually grant. Uh, but he understood, he said, I, I see these letters as um, sort of, uh, I don't mean to put words in his mouth, but basically he's, he's paraphrasing that he understood there was a frustration. Uh, but at the same time, there he thought there was also an ignorance of how the church's processes worked. And there's also been a second letter in regard to holy orders, specifically um, uh, a request by some clergy to, to sunset women's ordination. And um, canonically, that's baked into the cake, and it would require an act of assembly to ratify a constitutional change to uh, do away with what has been referred to as dual integrities. Um, and um, but one thing that um, Bishop, um, excuse me, Archbishop Beach said is uh, he said he's surprised that the letters that are released in open way are not actually addressed and to d delivered to him. And he said, um, or to the people who would be capable of uh, responding to this or taking action. Uh, and he said, so just so someone puts something out in the public square on a, a social media app doesn't mean he's going to respond to it if it's not actually addressed or delivered to him, even though he said the provincial staff may be aware of it. Sure. So um, that, I, that he was um, he, he, he was not uh, positive about how some of those uh, things had gone. And um, well, of course, had, I mean, uh, there's the famous uh, note that was uh, taped to or stapled to his door. Uh, mm -hmm. in the in the mm -hmm. Bishop Ruck case, and uh, so yeah, um, I, if I were Archbishop yeah. Foley, I would say some things did not work out the way they should have, and some people don't know how to uh, to communicate well. Yeah, and um, you know, sometimes we have to sh social media. Sometimes is a thing where we, we have to shout into the void because we're angry and we don't feel like we're being heard and we mm -hmm. want to be known. And um, I try not to do that but um that's something that's sort of been identified by archbishop beach he's his his most forceful words at the press conference were about clergy use of social media and he said sometimes people you know they have a, a tough day at work and they you know come home um have a couple drinks uh maybe getting into a fight with uh their spouse and then they go on social media and take it out on everyone and um that's i really like twitter as you know i'm on there pretty regularly sure. i find it to be a valuable platform and twitter has a strength in that it's extraordinarily good for breaking news you can get news out to your people like that um however it has some real weaknesses uh it by cultivating our own follow list we end up entering into siloed echo chambers in which there's confirmation bias and what we want to hear is um what we hear back and um, that's not always reality, or it's not the full breadth of things. So um, I think there was a real cautionary note from Foley Beach about clergy use of social media. And um, I would add on to that, and this is my words, not his, that um, our sphere of influence that is close to home matters most. Our relationship with our neighbors, our relationship with our, our um, fellow church members, mm -hmm. and um, that is something that that that's a garden that we're charged with tending um social media is sometimes further removed now i understand that if you have a, a niche interest and i think anglican christianity could be argued to be a niche interest <laughs> you think uh you know you're you're, you're gonna go and be like oh you know i want to connect with those people across the country with my same liturgical interests mm -hmm. and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that inherently but um we have to remember that um we have to have love and charity towards our neighbors and sometimes it's those interactions with the people we're walking around with in our neighborhood that are most important and if social media is taking a place in our lives that is displacing that like we're looking for community in social media affirmation rather than we're looking for 
uh, real relationship with real people who are our neighbors who we're physically interacting with, then there's a disordering of priorities there. Yeah, I'm saying that as a man who really likes Twitter and is on Twitter daily. Yeah. I mean, we can't replace virtual with real. And that's, you know, uh, no. Facebook and uh, X, uh, Twitter uh, are, are certainly places where we go there and we're having a relationship that is not real. Um, with people who we cannot verify are real. With news we can't verify is real. Uh, with conditions we can't verify is real where face-to-face, -face, as God intended, is real. So, And as the church does something that few other institutions in our present age are capable of doing, mm -hmm. which is when I go into my church and I sit down in the pew next to my fellow parishioners, some of them have very different views. They definitely have different ages mm -hmm. and different life stages from me. And yet I see their love for one another, their love demonstrated towards me, and I know that I cannot caricature them. That That's something that in-person, worshiping side by side with people, serving alongside with them week after week, going through the liturgy, which I've compared to water flowing over a rock. Over time, liturgy flows over our souls and shapes them, it shapes our minds. And um, that's something the church is offering that is not widely available through other institutions in our culture and when we think about where we're investing our time again twitter is a tool i think it's a tool that can be used for good but um if we come away constantly angry and we want to simplistically paint with broad brush strokes and we end up looking for confirmation of what we already believe then um there's there, there's, there's something that that is not correctly ordered there um, and it, it's better, I think, one thing I would encourage people to think about is if they get angry on social media, think about who's somebody who's in my life right now, who I know in physical proximity to me, that I can just invite out to coffee, that I can invite to lunch, that I could say, oh, can I bring you something? Um, what's a way that you can be physically present with your neighbor in a way that social media isn't capable of doing? This is not to say that social media isn't valuable for information exchange, but it is to say that do not look for real relationships on social media. Um, it, 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 social media will likely not be able to to reach what you are asking it to do. Well, yeah, because see, people are seeking truth. Social media can't provide truth. It can't provide real. It can't provide any of the, the experiences that uh, our human bodies are created to to do other than tickle the, the the fancy of the ears and the brains and and that's about it and yeah. uh i say this as a a youtube creator but you know it, it's it, it's not the way god designed the church and his people yeah. i want to thank you so much for your time i know you're going to drive home to washington and and uh yeah. just de decompress from a week in latrobe but you know in 10 more years uh, the church is going to gather again uh, in Latrobe, and I would expect it to be larger, healthier, mm -hmm. and still have elephants in the room. Yes, and let's trust in God's providence, mm -hmm. bring our, our real concerns, our fears, and our rejoicing before him. Mm -hmm. um, he's done really great things through this, this body of believers called the Anglican Church in North America. And um, if he can use us, he can use a lot of people. So um, I take heart in that. And I'm, I'm so grateful to have been here this week. Uh, this has been wonderfully life-giving. And um, I, I feel gratitude for those people who are stones that are, 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 are building something. And, of course, Jesus Christ, who's been made the cornerstone. Um, what a wonderful thing. What a great sign-off. I'm Kevin Carlson with Jeff Walton. You've been watching episode 866 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>